Well, good afternoon. It's great to be back in Jacksonville. Uh, I want to thank uh, uh, Ascension and St. Vincent's uh, for hosting us. I want to thank uh, Mayor Lenny Curry uh, for being here. Thanks for all his hard work. We've also got some, uh, uh, some elected officials here. We got Representatives Yarborough, Duggan, uh, Chuck Brannon, Jason Fisher, Senator Bean, and Representative Byrd. So I want to thank you guys for all you've done and uh, all you did this past legislative session. Uh, I'll make a few announcements at the end of this, but before we're going to uh, let, let the folks here uh, say some things, we'll have a little bit of discussion about, about the way forward. The one thing that I would say we've been stressing around the state is we saw when this pandemic hit, particularly when the when the hysteria and the frenzy uh, really reached its peak level, you saw a noticeable decline in people who would go to the hospital to seek medical attention for heart and stroke, uh, things that are, are really significant in terms of mortality. And we've been stressing, uh, if you have those types of problems, you need to seek medical attention. It's safe to come particularly in Florida, I'm going around these facilities. Um, I mean, they're so clean, they're so nice. Uh, you go in and seek the attention because by deferring that, you know, you're running huge risk uh, to your own health and welfare. And uh, coronavirus should not be something that would dissuade you from coming in. Uh, these are very safe environments. It's amazing throughout the state of Florida how few staff members have contracted uh, the virus because of their great safety procedures. I think the numbers you have are infinitesimal in terms of, of terms of that. So, so that's just the, so. So please go do that. Also, there's been a decline in uh, children uh, getting their uh, immunizations, and again, you know that's something that uh, is is something that should be done. We have seen in, in the past in in Florida. We've seen and throughout the country measles outbreaks. So if you're deferring those uh, because you're worried about coming in from coronavirus, uh, th don't do that. Come in, do it, take care of the kids. It's very, very important that that's done uh, because if it's not, if we have a critical mass of people falling behind on that, you definitely could see some more adverse health consequences as the time goes on. We have, we're in the midst of uh, our safe, smart, step-by-step -step approach to bring Florida back. And I think that Northeast Florida has done a real fantastic job throughout this whole process, not only in terms of the health outcomes, by really doing a good job of having uh, low infection rates, low hospitalization rates, and, and low death rates, uh, but also really uh, being an energy towards uh, reopening and getting people back to work and getting our society off the mat. Uh, you're not going to be successful in fighting uh, any type of public health challenge if you don't have a functioning society. Uh, and so we know we need to do that. And we also need to be mindful of some of the public health challenges that have stemmed from the mitigation. I mentioned some of the things earlier, but there's also clearly a need and will be an increased need for behavioral health. Uh, so we want to be recognizing that and understanding that, that those are going to be issues uh, that are not going to go away anytime soon. As I said, I'll have some announcements about our uh, next steps for the recovery. Uh, but before that, I want to kick it over to the mayor, and then we'll go around and, uh, and hear some, some good thoughts from everybody. Well, Governor, just want to thank you for welcome back to Jacksonville. Uh, and I just, I've said this before when we were together a week or so ago, but it, it's worth saying again, the collaboration between you personally and your team has been the model for how you get things done uh, in a crisis. And uh, the city of Jacksonville is grateful for that. Tom, thank you for hosting us here. Appreciate the entire team here at St. Vincent's and all of the people in our healthcare community that uh, have really worked to get us through this very trying time. Just want to take a moment to say that today is Peace Officers Memorial Day. So I want to thank all of our law enforcement for all the work they do uh, for us every day. And frankly, they've put themselves out uh, on the line with this unknown virus over the last eight plus weeks. And then just a couple data points that are worth mentioning. Our Jacksonville Fire and Rescue transports uh, that are COVID-related, suspect COVID-related, are way down. Uh, they're the lowest they've been in weeks. So that's another data point that continues to trend with our downward trend in positives and testing. And then to echo what the governor said about people getting the health care treatment they need unrelated to COVID, uh, our uh, opioid abuse, uh, it's, it's, it's up, it's high. Uh, we know people are dealing with mental health issues. 
uh, if they're having chest pains, whatever it is, uh, it, there's no reason to be afraid to be in a health care facility right now. In fact, you should do the exact opposite and go get the treatment that you need. Thank you, Governor. Great. Tom? Thank you, Governor DeSantis, and welcome to Ascension St. Vincent's Riverside. You and Mayor Curry have both been here for us and incredibly supportive from the very beginning, and we're deeply grateful for your leadership. Thank you and your respective staff members for your tireless efforts to be consistently responsive to our needs and open to our input in order to keep our communities healthy together. I also want to take a moment to say thank you to caregivers and essential workers everywhere who have worked tirelessly and courageously to care for our Northeast Florida community. And I want to thank our broader regional community for all the love and support you've shown our caregivers, physicians, and associates as we continue to work together through this, this trying and unfamiliar time. And I do need to take just a moment to recognize and celebrate our caregivers, our physicians, and our associates across Ascension Florida and Gulf Coast, including right here at Ascension St. Vincent's Riverside, who have simply, be they, they have gone above and beyond heroically to provide the clinically excellent and compassionate and personalized care for which we're known in the safest way possible, every patient, every moment, every day. Since early March across our Florida and Gulf Coast market, we've cared for roughly 3,000 hospitalized patients who were suspicious of having COVID-19. And 300 of these individuals did indeed test positive. And our teams have done an exceptional job cohorting our patients together in dedicated, isolated units in each of our hospitals. Together, we've experienced some extraordinarily trying and stressful times. But we've also had many emotional celebrations, and our physicians and our caregivers has successfully helped people battle and beat COVID-19. In fact, hundreds of patients have gone home after their time with us in the hospital, and we've lined our hallways, and we've clapped, and we've celebrated, and we've given thanks with each and every one of them. Across our regional health system, from the first coast to the Gulf Coast, our Ascension Medical Group immediately opened drive-through testing sites, and in total, we've tested over 10,000 individuals for COVID-19. We have truly led the way in making testing accessible and convenient for symptomatic patients, and most recently for residents and staff of our area nursing facilities. And while the statistics are important to quantitatively understand the magnitude of the challenge that we face for the last 10 weeks, we recognize that behind every number is a precious human life and a beloved child of God. And together we've traveled this shared human experience like nothing any of us have ever lived through the images and the stories from which will live with us in our hearts and our memories forever. And this important work has again highlighted for me the immeasurable value of being part of a strong regional and national health system. It's empowered us to work, truly work as one integrated ministry to share best practices and resources. We've been able to procure and resupply personal protective equipment, been able to access additional equipment like ventilators and dialysis machines whenever needed, We've been able to access essential medications, and we've been able to keep everyone on full salary continuation with no pay proration or job loss, even in an extraordinarily challenging economic environment. And none of this would have been possible were we not part of Ascension. And here in Jacksonville, we're also blessed to have exceptional communication and collaboration with our local elected officials like Mayor Curry and his entire staff. And between our city's health systems, like from the very beginning, We've all worked together multiple times every week to ensure that we provide everyone in our community with the care they need, that we're maintaining open lines of communication, and that we've operated aligned practices wherever possible. And we hope we've provided you with the input that you've needed, and we've greatly appreciated our communication relationship throughout. So in accordance with the governor's order, we began to reopen for non-urgent procedures on May 4th, and we've grown steadily and safely every day since, and we're testing every patient preoperatively to make sure we're keeping our patients and our physicians and our caregivers safe, supported, and protected. And throughout all this, I have been deeply moved by the caring and compassion and courage and selflessness and esprit de corps that I've witnessed every single day throughout our facilities and with caregivers and hospitals throughout the country. So I'd, I'd close in saying this, this challenge is far from over, but I'm confident that together we will indeed emerge victorious, smarter, and more unified than ever before. And with that, I'd, I'd ask uh, our Chief Clinical Officer, Dr. Gilberstadt, to share a few thoughts. Thank you, Tom. First and foremost, I also want to thank all of our doctors.
and our community as well for all of the support. We are truly blessed. I've, seen, I've been an emergency room physician for almost 30 years, and I want to reassure everyone in our community that we're here for you if you need emergency care. If you are experiencing symptoms of a heart attack, stroke, respiratory distress, emergency mental or behavioral health concerns, or other acute illness or injury, a hospital emergency room is still the safest, most appropriate place to get care. We've seen a concerning drop in the number of people coming in for serious non-COVID related issues. Staying home when healthy makes absolute sense. However, ignoring worrisome symptoms and suffering out of fear of COVID-19 is simply not a risk people should take with their health. Timely treatment is critically important for achieving the best outcomes and lessening the risk of complications. I can confidently tell you that we are prepared and set up for safely treating patients, including those who need emergency care. Separate intake and care areas, waiting room distancing, staff screening, ongoing use of personal protective equipment to make sure our patients are cared for in a protected environment. And we continue to monitor guidance from the CDC and the Florida Department of Health to adjust safety practices and safeguards accordingly. So if you're experiencing a life-threatening emergency or think you might be, don't delay. Go directly to an emergency room or dial 911. We're here for you and ready to care for you. And now Esther Lita Redman, our uh, Chief Medical Officer for Ascension Medical Group for Florida and the Gulf Market. Thank you, Dr. Gilberstadt. It can't possibly be said enough. Thank you to everyone on this panel and to our caregivers, essential workers, and government leaders everywhere. Across North Florida, Essential Medical Group has worked hard to provide drive-through testing, particularly for those who are symptomatic. As Tom mentioned, we've tested nearly 10,000 individuals across the state so far. In partnership with the Florida Department of Health, we've also recently begun to provide testing to both staff and residents of long-term care facilities. This work really speaks to our mission to provide care to all people with special attention to those most vulnerable. We have also seen a major increase in virtual care. We've had our virtual care platform, Ascension Online Care, since 2017. Over a typical six-week period, we would see an average of about 100 virtual visits across Ascension, Florida, and Gulf Coast. But from March 15th through April 30th, we've had more than 25,000 virtual visits across the market. We will be advocating that this openness to virtual visits remain in effect from now on for the convenience of our patients. For those who do need to visit their doctor or any of our outpatient clinics in person, I would like to echo Dr. Gilberstadt's sentiments and reassure everyone that all of our locations have the appropriate protocols and procedures in place to ensure everyone's safety. Please continue your routine to stay healthy, especially if you have pre-existing conditions. Call your primary care provider or specialist first to discuss whether an online visit might be an option for your care. If you can't talk to your regular doctor or if you need non-emergency care more quickly, virtual care like Ascension Online Care might be right for you. As we begin to reopen and get back to some sense of normalcy, I would also like to remind everyone to continue to practice social distancing, practice good hygiene when it comes to coughing and sneezing, and thoroughly wash your hands. Hand sanitizer is great, but fully washing your hands with soap and water for at least 20 seconds whenever possible is even better. Please don't get complacent. This virus is still here, and we all need to work together to keep ourselves and everyone around us safe. Thank you. Now I'd like to introduce Mandy Klippa, who is our Clinical Service Line Director for Pulmonology and Infectious Disease. Mandy? Thank you, Dr. Redman. As we've worked through this trying time together, we appreciate all of the community and government support that we've received. We are also thankful for our caregivers, many of them working in new and different roles to ensure that we are doing everything we can to provide testing and care for those in our community with COVID-19. This is being done in addition to continuing to provide care to everyone else who needs it. I especially want to thank our team who worked over a weekend at the beginning of this pandemic to quickly establish a drive-through testing site. Through their hard work and dedication, we were blessed to get 
the testing sites set up in our community and then work with other organizations to help set up additional drive-through testing opportunities. To further ensure everyone's safety, we've also established respiratory clinics for symptomatic patients. We were able to take the patient's history and other elements of a typical doctor's visit virtually. The patient can then visit us in person where the provider will come out to check their vital signs, perform a physical exam, and testing if needed. We're working hard to make sure we're providing care to everyone who needs it through our drive-through testing site and our dozens of outpatient clinics. We are so grateful for everyone's prayers and support throughout this process. Well, great. Um, can, can we, one of you, maybe one of the physicians, talk about we use the term elective procedures, and I think sometimes people think that that may mean like some type of cosmetic procedure. I guess cosmetic would be included in elective, but it's, but it's obviously broader than that. So what's the importance of people's health in terms of some of these procedures that are considered elective? Um, are they also still necessary for, for people to eventually get? As we've put off, I mean, basically elective procedures are procedures that can be scheduled. They're not in emergency nature, but as we push things further and further out, that can change. So as we've pushed back patients getting catheters for dialysis, getting joint repairs, their home suffering and pain, so we're constantly reassessing so you can get the bright priority of those patients coming back into the operating room. So we're, we're back doing that now, operating, and bringing those patients back in as clinically needed. But if we had just indefinitely suspended these, that would have had health consequences, correct? Oh, absolutely. They would become emergencies if you put them off yeah. too long. Well, we're glad that, that folks are doing that again. Um, you've seen kind of how the epidemic has affected uh, this part of the state. Obviously, I think that this part of the state handled itself very well. Um, are you in a situation where, as we go forward, you know, if there were to be a, an outbreak somewhere, you guys have the capacity to be able to handle what would come down the pike? Yes, sir, we do. We've, we're watching the data every single day meticulously, and we, we, our, our plans are fully in place should we see any bump in terms of how we would respond. But we've got more than adequate capacity in our ICU and our medical surgical beds with all of our clinical equipment and all of our staff. Great. One of the things we're seeing is you have, particularly outside of southeast Florida, a really low number of cases in, in all these counties. When you see it uh, be up out of the ordinary, it's usually one of two things, well, three things. A prison outbreak, which we're seeing, uh, a, a long-term care facility. And then there are times as we bring new testing centers in places, you'll see a temporary blip, and then it usually crashes right after that. Now, obviously, the prison is an enclosed environment. Uh, that's got to be handled within there. Uh, and then the test site, sometimes when you test more, you identify more cases. That's a, that's a good thing because you can isolate those people, give them care if they need it. The long-term care is going to continue to be uh, a, a challenge. We've, we've put a lot of resources towards that from the beginning in Florida. It was the, clearly the most biggest vulnerability, and, and I think that was the right thing to do. Uh, Mayor, you, uh, you guys were really quick on things like drive-through testing, the city, you had the sheriff, fire, your office. Um, will you guys be involved in long-term care testing for like staff and really looking at these long-term care facilities and making sure that we're doing all we can to assist them in keeping the virus out? 100%. In fact, if you look at the recommended testing per, uh, I think it's per uh, 100,000, uh, we already have the capacity to do that, and we're adding. We took a big chunk of our care money from President Trump and the federal government to add significantly more enhanced testing citywide to make sure that everybody has access. And I would just add to the answer Tom gave on hospital capacity. We, all the hospitals and my office, we every week we collaborate officially, formally, and then informally. And we're all on the same page, and we're all prepared. And I would just tell people, particularly if you're, if you're somebody that's working in a long-term care facility, we have the, the, Jackson, the, the Jaguar Stadium. We have this facility. We're going to continue having that drive-through test site. Uh, you really do need to be getting tested uh, probably once every two weeks because what we found here is that there have been some facilities that didn't follow uh, the regulations and the restrictions and allowed sick people to go in. And that obviously created problems. But... There have been places where you may not have a temperature, you may not have interacted with anyone with known, but you may be carrying it and be asymptomatic. And so if a staff goes in, it can spread amongst the staff, spread amongst the residents, you know, and that's when you have these, these, these outbreaks. And so 
the, the periodic testing of the staff is really, really important. This is one way. I know Ascension's doing other testing. Can you talk about some of the things that you guys have been doing? Because I know you've been doing some good stuff with, uh, with the long-term care facilities. Yes, in collaboration with the Florida Department of Health, we have started testing nursing homes. Um, to date, we've tested seven nursing homes along with ALFs, and it's been a really good experience for us, for the nursing homes, and for the associates. We stand ready to continue to provide that testing to nursing homes and long-term care facilities. And I'd like to turn it over to Mandy in case you want to add anything. No, I think it should just be mentioned that these, the testing we're doing is at um, facilities that have not had positive cases, so we're doing this merely as a screening for their residents and their associates. Um, I think the nursing facilities have done a great job adhering to the advice that they've been given from the um, local and national government re um, regarding cleaning and social distancing, et cetera, and, and we're seeing that in the results that we're getting. Yeah, it's amazing in Florida how many facilities we've had, we have here. Obviously, there have been cases, there have been outbreaks, uh, but, but our rates are so much lower than a lot of these other states. And we have thousands of facilities that never had a single infection this whole time. And then you have uh, other facilities where you may have had one or two, but it was contained in the, and you didn't have a cluster or an outbreak. And that, that's really, really important to be able to do it. So I think the, the screening, the staff, uh, being able to pick up somebody before they're showing symptoms, you know, that can really be the difference between preventing, um, preventing a major outbreak in one of those facilities. And as we've seen, there's certain venues that this disease does better in than others. It doesn't do terribly well uh, in outdoor environments. I mean, I know we, when the mayor did the beaches, I was very supportive of that. Uh, there were a lot of people out of state who were saying this is the end of the world. Obviously, you know, it totally fall on their face again with these predictions. Um, but that's because the environment is not conducive. What's conducive are enclosed environments where you're in repeated close contact with people. So you see prisons, you see these meatpacking plants throughout the country, and then obviously you do see some of these assisted living facilities and, and nursing homes. And so it's a vulnerable population, but then it also can be a conducive environment. Now, we do have some skilled nursing facilities that have the ability to isolate, negative pressure, all that, but, but not all of them do, and many of them don't, and particularly in some parts of southern Florida, it can be a real challenge. So that really is kind of uh, something that we're all going to go on. So I'm going to make some announcements, but just within our plan from the beginning about uh, protecting the state and fighting COVID-19, our number one from the beginning was protect the vulnerable because we understood that this disease had a disproportionate effect on the elderly and people with underlying conditions. Increased testing, very important. That's been a team effort. The state has done a lot of resources, local, the, the health care providers, it's been great. You know, you know, the appropriate social distancing, that's been done uh, very, very, I think, uh, well on behalf of the people of the state. Uh, supporting our hospitals and healthcare workers. We've, we've distributed huge amounts of PPE throughout the state and, and will continue to, to be helpful when we can on that. And then preventing the introduction of the virus from outside the state. I'm working per the president's request on a proposal for how we deal with international travel. Travel from China and Europe is, is suspended. But we still have people coming in from Brazil, which is having outbreaks. And so we've got to get a handle on that. And so we're, we're, we're working on that. And then I continue. We've screened for our New York quarantine over 50,000 travelers uh, since we instituted the quarantine. And I'm convinced that that, that absolutely helped uh, limit mitigate the spread uh, in the state of Florida because you had a massive outgrowth or a massive exodus from New York uh, down to Florida once New York went on mitigation. But protecting the vulnerable is something that is not going to change as we move forward and as we reopen Florida. And we've done a lot up to this point, which is very, very important, but we've got to do even more. You're seeing throughout the country that the bulk of the fatalities are now linked to nursing homes in, in most states. And uh, some of that was through some bad policy choices, but still, even in places where, where things were done well, you're seeing that. So we've just got to understand the threat and got to do it. So 
We very early recognized this. Uh, we prohibited, um, uh, required all the staff to be screened and any vendors to be screened. That was to identify people that were ill and that could spread the virus uh, in these facilities. And that requires temperature checks. It requires asking where people have gone. We also mandated the wearing of PPE, like face masks. Anyone that has any contact with a resident has to have gloves which is also something that's very important at helping mitigate the spread. And then we restricted visitation at long-term care facilities on March 15th. That was a tough thing to do because you're depriving family of being able to go in these facilities, but the risk of an outbreak was such that we felt we had to do it. And then also prohibiting hospitals from discharging COVID positive residents back to a long-term care facility. At that time, you had some states like the states like Pennsylvania, New Jersey, New York, some of them Michigan, I believe, who actually required long-term care facilities to accept COVID positive patients. And you had American Healthcare Association people said, don't do that uh, because you're taking somebody that is contagious and putting them in basically a tinderbox. And I think the results were you've had huge outbreaks in those states. We did the opposite. You know, we understood that it could affect our overall capacity in terms of hospitals, but we viewed it as, okay, if you're putting these patients back in, you're going to end up seeing really rampant spread, and then you're going to end up with more people in the hospital, not less people in the hospital. So that was, um, I think, an important decision. And actually, the, the Florida Health Care Association you know, said that they think it saved thousands of, thousands of lives. Certainly, when you compare Florida to these other states, how we've done in this environment, very, very important. We've also dedicated, established COVID-dedicated nursing homes to kind of help with this issue. The, the one here in Dolphin Point in Jacksonville, that's a, a relationship between the state of Florida and Dolphin Point. What that allows you to do is if you have a long-term care facility, you identify a resident who's positive. Just because you're positive, even at that age, doesn't necessarily mean you're going to end up in the ICU, but you do need to be isolated. So the resident that doesn't require hospitalization per se, but does need isolation, uh, a place like Dolphin Point can do that. They have the negative pressure. They have the ability to isolate. So you're having transfers out of nursing homes into places that can mitigate or, or prevent spread. That obviously helps those residents who are still in the nursing home. And so this has been a good model. It's required us to put in resources to it. But I think it's a good use of resources uh, because if you're keeping somebody in those hospital or in the nursing home and then the disease spreads, you're going to have way more health problems than just one, moving one patient to this. So we're, we, we have other places around the state where, where we're going to follow this model, uh, but I think that this is something that will be good, and I think a lot of the hospitals appreciate it too because you know, they have beds, and the beds want to be for the people who, who really need the care. Some of the nursing home residents obviously need serious care, but, but some of them just need to convalesce, and so this allows that opportunity without running the risk of spreading through a long-term care facility. Uh, we have a whole host of agencies that have been involved, ACA, Department of Health, deploying for in infection prevention and control. The Veterans Administration, U.S. Veterans Administration, uh, VA Secretary is a good guy, called me, said, hey, do you want us to do a, a field hospital or this or that? I was like, honestly, let's, we have these nursing, veterans nursing homes. You got to go in there and help us identify infection, test do what we need to do, and they said, um, yeah, we're there, and not only do they do, they do more than just the veterans nursing home, so they've been on the ground as well, uh, which has been very, very important. So you have a huge amount of visits, thousands of visits from these various teams from the very beginning uh, of this, and, and I think that that's helped reduce the infections that we've seen. The PPE is important because we're requiring them to do this, but in point of fact, most of them didn't have this type of PPE. I mean, some of them had some, but we really needed to put our money where our mouth is. And so we've delivered 10 million masks just to long-term care facilities in the state of Florida, a million gloves, half a million face shields, 160,000 gowns. And so that shows Florida's commitment uh, to supporting these facilities that house our most vulnerable residents. And then, of course, the Florida National Guard, we created 50 National Guard strike teams because we started to see, okay, we have all these screening procedures, we have limitations on visitors, uh, and they're following the procedures, and then you still were seeing an outbreak in certain parts, Suwannee County, for example, and it was because of asymptomatic. So we said we need to get people on the ground 
testing, particularly with an eye to identifying any asymptomatic carriers. And so they've done 238 facilities in probably the last four or five weeks, 50 different teams, 32,000 residents and staff. Uh, it's really, really been effective because as they've identified cases, uh, they've been able to isolate those cases and, um, and obviate bigger outbreaks. We also introduced a mobile testing lab. So this is the Cepheid 45-minute rapid test. So we can do 45, about 500 tests a day with a 45-minute turnaround. So this is a mobile lab in an RV, a converted RV that will go into communities. Teams will go to different facilities even, bring it back, run the test, and then you have the results the same day. That's a huge thing because if you send it to a commercial lab and it takes two, three days, well, you know, you, you can't, a lot of these people aren't going to be isolated that time, so you could have spread. So this is really, really significant. And then we're also doing Department of Health. I think CDC is going to be helping uh, sentinel surveillance of long-term care facilities. So a surveillance system is not that you test, you don't need, you're not testing every single person. You're testing representative samples to try to identify any incidence of the disease in various communities throughout the state of Florida. They do it with influenza. We're obviously going to probably end up as a country doing this society-wide for, for the coronavirus, but certainly for the long-term care facilities, very, very significant. So I raise that just to say that uh, as we go forward, uh, that having our eye on the ball there is very, very important. I think it's 32% of the fatalities in Florida are in the age group of 85 or older. And I think it's about 84% that are 65 and older. Of all the fatalities we've seen in Florida, that we've not yet seen a fatality under the age of, uh, I believe, 25. So there's a, a big uh, disproportionate impact here in Florida from people 65 and over. But I would say even more disproportionate as you get into the type of age group that would be at these facilities. You can open up an economy and still protect that, just like you saw other states that refused to protect the facilities, even though they were shutting down everything under the sun, uh, that didn't prove to be effective. And so with the collaboration of local governments, like with the mayor, with health care providers, you know, this really needs to be an all-hands-on-deck approach, uh, because if we can help keep it out of these facilities, you know, that's going to be a huge part of winning this battle. All right, so phase one. We went to phase one, but I made clear that we are going to go smart safe step by step. There were things in phase one, and this is the, the White House Task Force phase one guidance for what you could quote open up. And uh, if you look on some of those things, uh, schools and organized youth activities, we, you know, we, we kept daycare open the whole time in Florida, so that was not, not, not ever closed. The senior living facilities, obviously, we were restricting the visitation there too. Uh, large venues. So the White House guidance said you can do sit-down dining, movie theaters, sporting venues, places of worship, you know, obviously under physical distancing. We determined uh, in Florida not to do the movie theaters in, in our initial phase one. Uh, we did do limited sit-down dining, and then the places of worship were never, were never closed. I don't think constitutionally you can close it. It's ridiculous. You can Go to a liquor store, but you can't go to church? Um, give me a break. So we really work with the pastors to make it safe, and they understand that there's risk if you don't do it the right way. But I think that collaborative approach, respecting people's constitutional rights, is the better approach. But we, we knew we could have done more large venues under that guidance, but we decided that it was best to do. And I was recommended on my task force to do some more things that we did. Uh, elective surgeries we did put online because I think that's a public health issue too, very important. Uh, gyms could be open and bars remain closed. Obviously, the bars are closed in Florida. We did not turn on the gyms at that point. We were working on different safety pr procedures or whatever. So we really did kind of an initial phase one. We did not exhaust everything that we could have done in phase one. Uh, we wanted to go safely, smartly, and then we wanted it to be step by step. And so now we're in a situation where uh, you see kind of what we did, retail limited, restaurant indoor seating was limited. My recommendations for my task force were to be a little bit more robust on this. But again, we wanted to make sure that we're being uh, very, uh, very cautious with what we're doing, smart. 
I got a request after we went into initial phase one from the mayor of Orange County, Jerry Demings, about barber shops and hair salons. And basically, he had a task force, a lot of physicians involved, and they're like, look, you can do this in a low-risk way if you do some of these things. So I went down to Orlando, met with some of the salons and some of the, one of the barber shop owners. They've got great protocol. You go into these shops, it's like being in an operating room now. It's unbelievable. So we had safety precautions, and then we introduced that the following week. So that started uh, on Monday uh, to do those. And so I think that that's been going very well. But that's kind of our initial phase one. And then obviously bars, gyms close. As I mentioned, uh, we are requiring hospitals to test all individuals discharged to a long-term care facility for COVID, even if they're not in for COVID. Obviously, you need two negative tests if you're COVID positive to go back. But if you're just in for something else, and I think they're doing, they're, they're testing people anyways uh, with that, particularly everyone who comes in. So we really think that that's good. Uh, and then we are telling long-term care facilities, if you can't isolate, you know, we need to transfer those positive residents to places uh, that are going to be safe for everybody. Uh, and that falls into Dolphin Point and some of the other things that we're doing. All right, so that's where we were with initial phase one. Here's kind of what you see if you look at some of the cases. Now, clearly, we were having the bulk of our cases at the beginning of April. Uh, if you look on April 3rd was the, was the peak for new cases. That was reaching that number with uh, way fewer total cases than what we've been doing recently. Uh, so if you see as we got into early, it kind of plateaued throughout the middle part of April, and then you have seen a decline as we've got to the end of April and through, through May. Uh, and really in the last, I would say, week, um, anytime you have anything over, you know, four or 500, it's usually related to prison um, or a nursing home, and that's what we've seen particularly in the last couple days, these prison outbreaks. So in terms of new cases, you know, clearly uh, fewer cases coming in, even with more testing than what we were getting at the height. And if you look at kind of the end of March, I mean, the testing was still just really starting to accelerate. Now, I bet you if we had done the type of testing we're doing now, those numbers would probably be twice as high uh, back at the end of March, beginning of April. Uh, here's the positivity rate. So the positivity rate is important when they talk about the gating criteria. You look at the number of cases for the trends or and, maybe and or, but or the positivity rate. And the reason is, is if you really are, are trying to expand testing, you're probably going to identify some new cases, particularly in asymptomatic people. But if the overall number is still low in terms of who are testing positive, then that's a good sign. And I think you can see end of March, in the beginning of April, you know, we were at, um, you know, roughly 10, sometimes it even jump up to 15. Now, we never really rocketed high like a New Jersey or a New York where they were having, I think New York initially was like 60% were testing positive. New Jersey was in the 40s for a long time. So we, it had always been manageable here in Florida, but you know, you have seen the decline. And if you look at like the past 10 days, you know, you're in 2.6, 1.82, 2.7 some days. The last two days, um, it's increased from there, driven by the prison outbreaks. What you see in the prisons is if it spreads, you have a higher percentage that will test positive than in the general public. And so whereas the general public is still probably about 25 to 3.5% of everyone who tests uh, test positive, in the prison it's going to be more like 15% or even 20% will test positive there. And so that's really reflected, I think, on the 4.8 there for that. But clearly you've seen a decline in the positivity rate um, uh, since the, the apex of the outbreak. And then look at the tests. So just as the 45-day new cases went from left to right, you saw a downward trend. Here, when you go left to right, you clearly see an upward trend. Some of the, the jagged parts are more just based on how this stuff's reported. So if I have uh, 7,000 one day and then 20,000 the next, probably means I was probably somewhere in between there, just when the labs return it. But, you know, we pretty much do um, 15,000 to 20,000 uh, is kind of where, where we've settled into. We have capacity to do more. If people want to test at our drive through sites, walk-up sites, by all means do it. The tests are there for you. Uh, but quite frankly, we've not had huge demand at some of these. I mean, I remember Jacksonville was kind of the first indicator. We set it up. People were, came out, then they dropped, and they expanded the criteria, expanded, and, and, it, and it, it just has always been very manageable. That's a good sign 
because if people are sick, they're probably going to want to go in. So it's probably a signal that there, there's less incidence of the disease. At the same time, if people, even if they're asymptomatic, if they just feel they may have been exposed, come in, come to Jack, Jaguar Stadium, go to our other sites throughout the state. Um, but, but clearly you've seen an increase in testing, and our capacity is more than the 20, I guess the most we've done. package that we're proposing is about 34 million dollars uh, in business support small business up close to where it was probably at the beginning uh beginning of the year same same with the influenza like illnesses uh you really seen a decline statewide in terms of the the visits that we're seeing which is again something that you're monitoring as you look to see with these serological tests and the antibody tests, you'll hear people, man, I had a nasty illness in January. I was negative for the flu, negative for other things. Maybe it was this, you have the antibody. Maybe you did have, we, we, we don't really know when, when it first came to the United States, but my view is, is if it's in China in November, it's gonna be in the United States somewhere by December. Um, and I think we're starting to see that, that you do see in different parts uh, of the country that it was there. Um, and so you look to see whether you're testing or not is one thing. Whether you even know the dang things out there is one thing. But you will see the indications in the hospital if you have people who are getting infected that are in particularly the risk categories. And so this is why looking at the visits um, is good. You see the cough associated admissions. Again, doesn't mean they're all COVID, but it's kind of a proxy, uh, really the peak uh, late March, um, early, early April. Same thing with, um, you see cough and then also uh, uh, fever and shortness of breath. I remember there was like news reports saying like, I think it was like kind of, you know, towards the end of March, like, oh, there's this app that's showing Florida's on fire. You have all these fevers. And I'm like, and I asked my guys, I was like, is this scientifically valid? And they're like, no. And I was like, okay, but you look from the end of March, look at how the fever, I mean, it goes down. It didn't explode. I mean, so it just shows you some of the stuff that gets put out there. All right, there's the uh, fatality by date. Uh, you know, when, when states report, they report what's given to them, and that may be the day before, but a lot of times it could be previous. It just depends when it gets reported up. So you saw an ascending uh, on the fatalities, 56 on the 17th of April uh, peak. It's kind of plateaued a little bit, and then, you know, has, has started to go down uh, since then. I'll talk about the hospitalization, critical hospitalizations, which is really, you know, the indicators about what risk of fatalities that you're seeing statewide. So, so here's a good indicator. So when we started the initial phase one, we had 600 Floridians in the ICU for, for COVID-19. Uh, as of last night, we were at 472. So that's a 21% decrease in ICU COVID hospitalization statewide from start of phase one to where we are today. Ventilator use statewide, we were at 340 uh, on May 4th, uh, down to 232. 32% decline in ventilator use from when we started phase one to where we are now. We have throughout the state, I think about 6,500 ventilators that are just available for use. So there was a lot of stuff written about people were gonna run out of ventilators. Some said Florida was gonna run out of ventilators. I can tell you uh, there was never a danger of that, uh, of anyone that's needed a ventilator has had a ventilator. And then you look at the fatality rate. So if you look uh, apples to apples comparisons, if you do fatalities per 100,000, you look at, at states like Illinois, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Massachusetts, Connecticut, New Jersey, New York, obviously a much different picture. We do have the most vulnerable population in the country in terms of our demographics. We have uh, thousands of these long-term care facilities. Obviously, we're one of the leading destinations for not only domestic, but also international travel. And so that is, um, um, you know, much better numbers than what we've seen in, in some, other, some other parts of the country. All right, so today uh, we are going to move in effective Monday into what I would call a full phase one. Some of the things that we, we could have done but didn't do initially, uh, we are now adding, and I think that this is appropriate given the progress that, that Florida's made. I think it's fully consistent with our 
safe, smart, step-by-step -step approach. And I know I've had people like the mayor asking me, when can we do more, when can we do more? And I appreciate that input because he's the guy that's on the ground. He knows. He's talking to all these folks, the business owners, the, the moms, the dads. And it's all very important to hear that. And I think we're hearing that throughout the state. I was yesterday down in South Florida with Mayor of Broward County, Mayor of Dade County, and they requested, they have plans to go into the initial phase one. So they're going to be doing that on Monday. They had been counties that we didn't include initially because they had had a different scope of the epidemic. But uh, I think you've seen a lot of desire to be able to move forward. I think everyone's committed to being smart and being safe, but I do think people want to move forward. And why would we have moved forward to begin with? Remember, when we went into mitigation as a country, the reason why people said that we needed to do it, because if you let the disease simply spread or spike, you could be in a situation where you overwhelm the hospitals. And the hospitals wouldn't have capacity to treat patients. That would, of course, lead to excess fatalities. So by doing mitigation, you, quote, flatten the curve to make sure that the healthcare system keeps up with this. There were articles written in Florida newspapers in March saying that by April 24th, Florida would have 474,000 Floridians hospitalized because of COVID-19. Now, I don't know what that number means to, to, to people that aren't familiar with kind of the system here, but I can tell you we have about 70,000 licensed hospital beds in the entire state. So if they're saying 464,000 hospitalizations, that means you'd have almost 300,000 people with no ability to get care at all. So that was a terrifying prospect. I mean, that was sowing a lot of fear and angst. It wasn't based on any, any real data or facts, but it was put out there. And so I, I kept that in mind because I knew, you know, our approach was going to be effective. And on April 24th, we didn't have 464,000 hospitalized. We had 2,000 statewide hospitalized, and half the hospital, most of the hospitals in the state had a close to 50 percent capacity. So the curve was flattened. We never had anyone that was even threatened without having a bed or a ventilator or what they needed. And so because we succeeded there, it doesn't mean the disease is gone. It doesn't mean that we're not going to still have to do things to be able to protect the folks that are the most vulnerable. Uh, but the American people never signed up for a perpetual shelter in place. And we need to be able to get society functioning again. So that's why we did it. It was based off the data. It was based off the facts. It was based off the trends, the hospitalizations. And, and that's why we're now able to go to full phase one. One thing I'll say before I go into this, when you're looking at new cases, uh, and we've seen prison, some of this other stuff, you know, it's important to, to note that. But the most important thing that, that I'm looking for are how many of those cases are clinically consequential? I mean, if we're testing asymptomatic people in their 20s, these are people that may never even know they have the disease or have it so mild. So if you have 1,000 people who are healthy in their 20s get it, you're going to have less clinical significance of that than if you had 100 people who were 85 and plus in a nursing home. And so part of our strategy going forward is obviously we'd like there to be no cases, but I don't think that this disease is just going to go away. But can we not have as many clinically significant? And certainly we've seen fewer clinically significant cases over the past three or four weeks, which is a really, really good sign. All right, so full phase one, what does it mean? Uh, the long-term care facility is going to be a big part of phase one, uh, even more going forward. We want all staff to be tested. And, uh, and that's just very important. That's going to be a multi-pronged approach. Uh, we do need long-term care facilities who have the ability to self-test to let us know. We can provide the lab capacity. We can provide the supplies. If you have people who are trained to do that, very important because that's a, that, that's a force multiplier for us. Uh, and we're also going to continue to expand our great mobile testing teams with the National Guard and the Florida Department of Health. Uh, from the beginning, we've said any healthcare workers, you go through these drive through sites, no problem. We also have serological testing, Jacksonville, Orlando, Palm Beach, and Miami. We're going to be expanding that. That's great for healthcare workers to know, particularly if you work in a nursing home, do you have the antibodies? If you have the antibodies, then that's a huge thing for uh, a nursing home to know about some of its staff members. So we would, we would encourage frequent t testing for diagnostic, but also take the antibody test, very, very important. And we are working with the hospitals, 
just what Ascension is doing by going into these communities and doing testing, particularly at facilities where we may not have any evidence of an outbreak to make sure there's no asymptomatic spread going on. Very, very important. They've been great here. You have some other places around the state like the Cleveland Clinic have done great. And so we just want to encourage hospitals to do that. It's in all of our interest to protect the vulnerable, but also just from a healthcare resource perspective, if you keep it out of the facilities, you're going to devote less resources to patients coming in because there aren't going to be as many as, uh, that are infected. And then obviously we were going to work with uh, integrated public health system, local county health departments, very important. Obviously the mayor can work with his here. Carlos Jimenez down in Miami, he's all over this, and it's very, very important. So we want to continue to do that. We're also going to continue to do the elective surgeries. It's important for people's health, and the hospitals have proven they can handle anything that comes with COVID and still do this. All right, restaurants. We had started uh, initially outdoor seating six foot apart with 25% indoor capacity. Uh, we are now going effective Monday to operating up to 50% capacity. And a lot of that is based off the spacing of the tables or if you have some type of partition, because I've had some restaurateurs tell me, hey, I got plexiglass, my booths, I can't move them, but I have plexiglass. That's fine, that's effective. All we're trying to do is create a low risk environment. And I really appreciate a lot of the uh, folks that own restaurants who have been thinking deeply about this throughout this crisis. A lot stayed open to do takeout, but some didn't. And some are more conducive to dine-in. That's just what they have to do. We also, I think, the outdoor seating has been interesting. You've had some cities where they've closed parts of the street so that people can have more room to do outdoors. And that's just based off the science that this thing is not as transmissible outdoors as indoors in an enclosed environment. So I think that that's something that a lot of the people in the restaurant industry were hoping for. I think it can be done safely. A lot of other states already went to that right off the bat. My initial recommendation was to do 50% for my task force. I wanted to ease into it, uh, but I think that they've really thought well about it. So that'll be effective on Monday. And the same with retail. We started off with 25% of indoor capacity, uh, go to 50%. There's very clear guidance from CDC and OSHA, and I know a lot of the retailers have been doing it. And look, we were doing retail in some form or another this whole time. You had Home Depot open, you have Walmart, you have all these places open. So there's not a whole lot of difference to me between going into a Home Depot or going into a Joanne Fabric or some of these other places. I mean, you can do it, and particularly for our smaller mom and pop retailers, you know, very, very important for them to be able to, to have safe options for their customers. Museums and libraries, 50% uh, capacity. That'll be, uh, local governments can obviously make those calls uh, in terms of the museums and libraries that they're operating. Gyms and fitness centers, so effective Monday, Gyms uh, can operate. Uh, make sure that you have the respect the social distancing capacity. Uh, I would say for some of these places like CrossFit that do outdoor training, that's great. Uh, the outdoor stuff, again, that's a, a, a lower risk environment in an outdoor than if you're inside a stuffy room in a gym doing something where you know, you're going to potentially be exposed to, 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 to respiratory droplets. So we would tell people, just like how the restaurants are seating, I've seen people out in CrossFit and all these other ones doing things outside, that's fine. If you're inside, make sure you're doing the social distance and then sanitize machines and surfaces after use. I mean, that should be happening anyways. I mean, if you're sweating on the dip bar, clean the dip bar when you're done doing dips. I mean, come on. But I think it's important, and CDC was really about close the gyms. And I was like, okay, you know, look, I, I tried to, to, to work constructively, but you think about it. This is a respiratory virus that tends to attack people who have, who have some health problems or who aren't as in good physical condition. So don't we want people to be getting exercise? Don't we want people to stay in shape? It's going to actually make them more resistant to severe consequences. So I think this is good. I think it's important. And, uh, and that'll start on Monday as well. Professional sports venues, I've been vocal the last couple days. Uh, any Florida team, basketball, hockey, baseball, you obviously could, could train uh, all you want, basketball. I know the NBA, some of these places are thinking about getting back in. Go ahead and train, no problem. And then once the season starts, you're going to be able to use our venues, use the venues. We want you playing. I've also said to other teams and other leagues is if you have states that simply are not going to budge and allow even 
competition with no fans. You know, ESPN in the morning now, you watch, they have Korean baseball on. There's nobody in the stands. So how is that? That's not going to bother anybody. So I think it's important that we get sports back up and running. The mayor and I worked on bringing UFC to Jacksonville. And what was happening was UFC was running into problems in California, some of these other places. They wouldn't let them do it. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, they want to fight in an empty arena. They test the people before they go. That is as low risk as you get. And so I said, if you do, I'm 100%. We reached out to UFC. We said, guys, come. And I think it's been very successful. And then now what happens is UFC knows they have a welcome environment here in the state of Florida, just like WWE knows. Now, we had to cancel WrestleMania in April. That's hundreds of millions of dollars of economic impact. You know, we've, we've allowed them to keep using their training center and, and film. You know, they know Florida is a good place to be. We're going to get a WrestleMania back here, you know, as soon as we can and get that economic impact. But any of these uh, teams in other states where they're just not going to let, let them play, uh, we have additional facilities here. I've already spoken to some of the universities, uh, and I think it would be, uh, it would be fine if people want to use, use facilities here. We, we, we welcome it. We think it's very important to do and to get back going. And I know some of the leagues are working on when they come back, baseball maybe July. I know the NBA, some of the players are talking about we've got to get back on it. So we'll see what happens. But uh, we want, we've, I think, done a good job of welcoming this stuff done. Uh, UFC, we're having, there's a charity golf match at Seminole Golf Club down in, uh, in uh, Juneau Beach on Saturday, on Sunday. It's going to be on NBC. You got Dustin Johnson, Ricky Fowler, some of the, Rory, some of these great players at, at the best, uh, most iconic course in Florida. And then the following Sunday, you got Phil Mickelson, Tiger, Tiger Woods with Tom Brady and Peyton Manning. And they're going to do that in Florida too. And both of those events are going to raise millions and millions of dollars. Uh, for charity. So, so we're happy that those are being hosted in the state of Florida. Amusement parks. Parks can submit reopening plans to the state. They should identify the date certain that they believe that they could resume safe operations. They have to provide how they're going to do it, how they're going to accommodate the guests, how they're going to protect the staff, and then they need to have an endorsement from the relevant official uh, in their locality, uh, Orange County Mayor, wherever you're, wherever you're talking about. Uh, I've watched, I was watching during the middle of March when Disney and Universal were still operating. They had determined that they were going to close, uh, but they, they said, we're going to keep people here through the weekend because the people have nowhere to go. And I fully supported that decision, but they were doing a lot of stuff even then uh, to promote hygiene and distancing. And so I know that they've been working on this a lot. I know Disney's got a run going on in Shanghai. Uh, but, uh, you know, my goal on all this, uh, let's keep safety first, but let's work and innovate to get to yes on this stuff. So I can't tell you when this is going to be, uh, but I think that we need to say, come up with your plan, show us what you got, work with your local officials, and then we'll see, uh, we'll see what we can do. All right, so those are, uh, that brings us really into full phase one. I think the only thing we're not doing that the uh, president's guidelines permitted were the movie theaters. And I'm not saying we're never going to do that, but I believe, and I've been a broken record on this, when you're in enclosed indoor environments, the virus is just more transmissible. Uh, and so how you would socially distance in there, I'm not saying it can't be done, uh, but I would probably need a little bit more information before I pulled the trigger on that. Of course, drive-through theaters are 100% fine and are, and are virtually no risk. And so, so we'd encourage people to do the drive-through. So we will look and see with some of the things that were permitted in phase one, like the movie theaters. But I think that, that this is a good approach. Uh, I could have done this right off the bat, but I thought that we want to make sure that we're getting our footing. And I think we have done that. I think people have responded very well. And I want to thank the people of Florida for, for working really hard over a very difficult period of time. Uh, I said uh, two weeks ago, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. We have a pathway back. And this continues us on that journey. So, so God bless everyone for all they've done. Questions? Uh, Governor, um, question about the unemployment system. Um, using the outside vendors and all of that, there have been reports that they've been furloughed out-of-state vendors. Do you worry about data security in these situations? And what do you say to people who have been waiting for weeks and months to have their, their claims well, We've paid out close to $2 billion in unemployment. Uh, we had a, a system that was a disaster. It was designed to have 1,000 people on at a time, and it could surge to 5,000 people. That was what it was designed for. 
Well, when you stop the economy, you had 100,000 people trying to access the system. So the system broke. So we had to make a decision about how do you go forward with this because people were really, this is not a, just a normal recession type thing. There was a lot of upheaval. And so we looked into, could I do an emergency procurement, just get something up and running? And bottom line, that would have taken like a year. Uh, it, just, it just wouldn't have worked. Uh, what about, could we just figure out a way to do like maybe paper or do that? But the problem is you have to check all these databases and there's no way manually that would work. So we decided to get some, some engineers in there. We've got to figure out what the problems are. And, and in fact, the system was so bad that it had to basically be redesigned. And you had to bring in, I think we brought in 75 new servers for capacity. And so the result of that has been late March, early April, very difficult, a lot of changes made. And then now what you've seen really over the last three weeks, you've probably seen a billion and a half dollars paid out. You've seen at least 700 to 750,000 new claimants. And I think those are going to continue to be processed. So people are getting paid. Uh, and, and I know it wasn't an easy situation because there was a lot of stress. Uh, but I think that given the hand that we were dealt, uh, we made the decisions necessary to get money going. And so we probably will pass $2 billion in terms of payments. We may already be at that, but we're, we certainly will very soon. And I know that that's made a big difference uh, for a lot of people. So there's still going to be work that needs to be done on it because it's just like if you have a jalopy and they put you in the Daytona 500. You know, how do you do it? Uh, you know, ideally, you would just bring in a nice, nice new stock car, but you have to do so. It's kind of like putting a Porsche engine um, in a jalopy to be able to do it. And, and, but, but fortunately, there have been a lot, of, lot of bit, a lot of money that's been gone out. And I think that that, and we've had to work. I think what some people don't, don't appreciate is it's not just the state doing this. I mean, you have to check against all these federal databases. So we were at a situation one time where applications were coming in, the processing was working, and then you'd have to go through the Social Security database. And it was like 500 approvals a day. Well, okay, do the math on that. When, when would you, you be in like December before you even came close? So we've had to troubleshoot all these different things to be able to get people paid in the context of a system that was never designed for a voluntary secession of the economy. And so I think some folks have done really good under difficult circumstances. We're going to have uh, some more, uh, I think, some real more good numbers here in the next couple days. But uh, it's been something that we've devoted a lot of time because it's important to a lot of people. And I know when people all of a sudden don't lose, when they lose a job through no fault of their own and they have to worry about rent and food and all this, uh, this is important, and so we put a lot of time and effort to it. And I'm just glad that, that the money is, is, is going out the door. Governor, you touted call center numbers as an example of what the state is doing to mitigate the influx of all these new claimants, and yet we're now learning that many of these people who were brought on to answer calls were not only not trained to answer claim-specific questions, but were told not to answer calls. Well, some are. It's true, because what happens is, is you have the, the majority of the calls in late March and early April were not just about, hey, what do I do? It was, I need my PIN reset. So they were going on the site, maybe they had had unemployment in the past, and they were trying to get their PIN reset. So that was a huge percentage of this. And so those folks are there to be able to walk them through. They can go on the system, reset their PIN, so then the user can go in, log back in, put whatever information they need to, and then submit a fresh claim. So the PIN reset is actually a big part of this, and, um, and that's why you have those folks there. And for these people who have been waiting since mid-March and still... Who, who's been waiting? I'm getting emails every day. Can you give me the, the names? I send, I send every day to DEO. I send examples. And so what have they said? DEO has told me that they're looking through these claims, and yet we've heard nothing. You've said the DEO is looking through social media and is watching news reports. Well, do you have them with you? Can you I give do. them to me? I do, absolutely. Okay, do it. Because I can tell you that DEO goes through this, and nine times out of ten, the application is incomplete. And I think if you have applied in, in that time period and your application is complete and you qualify, uh, I think 99.99% of those folks have been paid. If you don't put a social security number in or you don't put the wages in, there's just certain requirements, then you do it. So what they have found is when they go back and do it, then some people are like, oh, okay, then they'll go fix it and then they can go, or some people just aren't eligible for it. So, but I would like to get those names because it's important that we go based off 
the actual facts, the actual eligibility, not anecdote, not just somebody that put something out, and that's why they've been so proactive about reaching out when they find these different stories to say, okay, what, what, how can we help, how can we do this? And, um, and I will tell you, a lot of the applications have been incomplete. So especially if you're in that Mar late March period, uh, you should have been processed by now if your application was complete and if you're eligible. So if they haven't been, I want those names. We'll bring it over to the agency later today and see if we can get working on it. Does anyone have any questions about kind of Florida's reopening? <laughs> yes. Governor Jennifer and News for Jax. We're getting a lot of questions about both bars and short-term rentals and when they will be allowed in that reopening process. So the bars were not included in the phase one White House guidance, and I didn't see the need to really to jump over that. So we're status quo on the bars. For the vacation rental, short-term rentals, uh, what we're doing is telling counties, if you want short-term rentals, you request it to be authorized through, through the state and provide your safety plan. If you tell me you're going to rent them out to people from New York City, I'm probably not going to approve that, okay? If you're saying that, you know, you're going to rent it out to people in other parts of Florida or something that would be manageable, if there's ways in there that clearly you have an eye to safety, then I'm fine. I'm also mindful of the fact that this epidemic, and I said this from the beginning, was not something that was affecting the state in an even way. You had different parts that were more significantly affected. You have had other parts. Parts of the panhandle have been incredibly lightly affected, and so they want to be able to do some of these things. So... It's going to be done on a case-by-case -case basis, but I am giving them the option of submitting a, a, a plan, but the plan's got to, got to include, you know, how you're going to approach this, what are the safety precautions going to be, and some of them have been upset because we, we never shut down hotels in Florida, but part of the thing is I have National Guard. I got all these National Guard I got to put up. I got other people I got to put up, so we needed to have an, an ability to have, to have hotels, so it's a little bit different situation. What about tattoos? Okay, go Governor, if you could tell us about the concerns for people here in Florida about a possible second wave and they think that maybe this is too fast too soon how do you make sure that they feel that their communities are still safe well, well great well I think there's a couple things one a second wave when you hear that I think a lot of people are thinking it's going to resurge in the fall uh, kind of like some influenza epidemics have happened and the fact is nobody really knows I mean I think we've got to be prepared for that nobody really knows uh, in terms of having like a wave in, in, in May, you, know, you have not seen that in other states like Georgia that's done. Obviously, our two, I showed the hospitalization numbers. We started phase one. Our ICU and ventilators are down significantly, uh, so we haven't seen a, a new rush to the hospitals. So we'll just keep viewing it. But I think the way it's going is uh, throughout the country, you, know, you do see it receding. And you see these spots of the nursing homes, of the jails, of some of these other places, meatpacking plants. And so that's why I've, I've, I've been, I stress the long-term care facilities because I just think if you see cases in a community, it's likely to be tied to that, likely to be tied to a prison or something of that nature. Now, of course, we'll be looking to see if there's some type of organic outbreak in the community somewhere, and that'll be something to address. But uh, you hear a lot about all of a sudden people are talking about the need for, quote, contact tracing. Media didn't talk about that two months ago because when we were doing our plan, we had different measures in South Florida than in other parts of the state. And one of the things I pointed out is we have a in fully integrated public health system. We contact trace in Florida. That's been a big part of the approach. And so in some of the areas that didn't have major outbreaks, you had huge success in containing it to lower numbers because you're actually doing just the basic public health contact tracing. So that's going to continue to go on. It's going to be done in a way that is not violating people's rights. I see some stuff say the government should be able to follow, follow your cell phone everywhere you go. Uh-uh, that ain't happening here. Uh, we're not going to have the government watching over everything you do. But you can do the basic, you know, traditional by-the-book tracing of if you were at a church and you got sick, who were you sitting around? What other did you do if you were at this event? And, and really do that. And I think that that's important. So, so we'll definitely monitor it. But I think if you look also at the European countries, you, know, you look, at, look at Sweden, look at Denmark, look at Switzerland, uh, they have not seen any type of, 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 quote, immediate second wave. So I think when people talk about the second wave, I think they're talking about what will happen uh, when we get into the fall season. Nobody knows. 
Uh, I've, I've said approach this with a lot of humility because you're talking about a novel virus and you can look at it like influenza and you could say it's different and in fact obviously I think it has been different in certain key respects doesn't mean you're not going to have a seasonal resurgence so I just think we everyone should just be prepared everyone should re recognize that you will never get to a point where you can just say it's gone and even you hear about a vaccine First of all, whether you even have a vaccine is not a guarantee. We don't have vaccines for other coronaviruses, but let's say you do. Who's to say it's 100% effective? It's not, obviously, for the flu. So these are things where you may never have it zero. I don't know. I hope you do. But you just understand, hey, here's out there. Let's protect the vulnerable. But I do think as long as you're protecting the vulnerable, uh, the cases will be less likely to be clinically significant, which is really, I think, the important thing. Um, summer camp, should parents and kids get ready for summer camps this summer? So we're going to have an announcement on that, but I think, you know, my view is uh, we need to move forward with that. Uh, I haven't dis fully decided that. I mean, obviously we want to look at the, look at the uh, available evidence, but I think having the kids out of school has, uh, look, at the time we didn't know what we were doing. I mean, I understand why that was recommended. Uh, but I think to deprive kids of having any type of activities over the summer, particularly young kids, uh, I, I think would be a big mistake. So we're going to work on that. It's something that's very high on my agenda. If you think about it, I mean, you've had kids, high school kids, had their seasons taken away, uh, school activities, school plays, all these other things that are so integral to people's growth and the memories that they take from these things. And that was just taken away. And you don't hear anybody really talking a lot about that. You don't hear about the weddings that were canceled, the family reunions that were canceled, all these kind of signal moments in life. Uh, but to me, all that is very, very important. I'm also just as a parent of three young kids, very comforted by the data that I've seen throughout this whole thing that shows uh, that, that this is very low risk for young kids. And I think that's the, the, the data that's overwhelming. And I know people will always try to say, oh, you know, to try to scare parents, but the data is overwhelming. The CDC says kids are more likely to be hospitalized through influenza than they are through coronavirus. So that's important to know. I think what's also important to know is to look at the observed experiences in other countries. So for example, you have places like Switzerland, Iceland, Sweden. Their view of it is that this is actually with kids not even like influenza where kids are viewed as vectors. They're in school, it's a petri dish, they infect each other, infect the teachers, infect the parents. They think it's opposite. They think that the parents usually infect the kids and that the kids aren't important big vectors for coronavirus. I don't know what, what the truth is uh, for sure, but I think a lot of their experiences are very important to, to, to know and think about, and I think that research is something we better take very, very seriously. I also look at Florida's experience. Uh, we never closed daycares in the state of Florida. I didn't see any way you could do it, especially when we're talking about stress on the healthcare system. How am I gonna tell a nurse that you have to, that your, your, your son or daughter is gonna have no, no one to watch them? So we knew we had to do it. But what you've seen is, you, I don't know that we've seen any outbreaks tied to daycares, but we certainly haven't seen a lot of outbreaks tied to daycares. So let's look at the facts and the science and then let parents make decisions that are, that are the best for their, for their kids. But um, I think a lot of families are interested to getting some activities going again. And again, the school year is distance learning for the rest of this year. Uh, but as we get beyond that, as we get into June, there's so many different things that I think people are going to want to be doing. And my view is depriving those kids of that absolutely carries a significant cost. And so we need to weigh that cost um, against whatever, uh, whatever health, um, health issues there are. But I would say the experience in Florida has been very, very low risk for minors, uh, which I think is a really, really good thing. And I've said many times, I would have no problem with my kids playing with other kids or doing that because I just view them as a low risk uh, environment. I think there's a whole bunch of other risks that are more significant that parents happily accept every single day. And so we need to get there. Uh, I, I don't know when we'll announce, but I think we've got we've to figure out a way to do that. I, I, I really worry about depriving kids of the ability to be kids 
And for how long are you going to do that? Is that just going to be indefinite, that they're not going to have any activities? They're not going to be able to play any sports? What are they going to do? Um, so, so we need to get there. And I think, I think we can. And I know the mayor has been, uh, been uh, bu bugging me about it to try to, to, try to get us there. Uh, and, I, and I think we can. I think we can. So, uh, but anyways, I want to thank uh, St. Vincent's Ascension. This, is, this has been really good, what you guys have done. Uh, I'm excited to be able to, to take some more small steps uh, toward Florida's recovery, but I think they are important steps. I think that what we've done on some of the restaurants will go from taking a restaurant that was going to be potentially not viable, giving them a path to be viable, uh, which is very, very important. And then I think some of these other things like the gyms, I think a lot of people really want to get back in there and do their thing. So, so that's going to be effective Monday. And we'll continue uh, to work very hard on behalf uh, of the people of Florida. So thank you, Mayor. Uh, thanks to St. Vincent's for, for all you're doing. And thanks uh, to the folks in Jacksonville. Take care. You are watching the Florida Channel, a public service made possible by...